Happy Sunday, FCBC. This is again, truly the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. So grateful to be here and so grateful most of all for those of you who attended last Sunday, our first in-person live service. I know everybody was not able to get in. We had a minimum amount of people we allowed in, but good, guess what? Good things are on the way. That's all I can say. Good things are on the way. But thank you for being so gracious, so supportive, so cooperative on that day. Uh, it was not easy, but we're grateful, grateful again that we were able to have that service. And we thank God to be back in the building. Well, a few announcements before we get started. One, we are having a pre-Father's Day giveaway. We are accepting monetary and in-kind donations to reach our fundraising goal of $5,000 and to provide care packages for fathers. A $45 donation will purchase one care package for a deserving father. Donation items include black ties, dress socks, sweat socks, undershirts, t-shirts, and if you want to make any donation that's in kind or monetary, you can go to fcbcnyc.org to view, to view the full list of donations and items that we're looking for and make a monetary donation. On the 19th, we're going to be having this pre-Father's Day giveaway. We're going to be supporting and uplifting many of the fathers in our community, in this neighborhood, and you can be a part of that effort by making those donations, again, in kind and monetary. Also, our young adults are having a Juneteenth service event on the 19th as well. That is Juneteenth. In recognition of Juneteenth, FCBC young adults are invited to volunteer at the Jackie Robinson Community Garden on Saturday, June 19th at 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. So that's Saturday, June 19th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. for a chance to help rebuild the garden path. You can email Pastor Trey at T Walrin. T W A L R O N D at FCBCNYC.org for details and to express interest. That is for our young adults. We want to encourage our young adults to make sure you volunteer. We love to worship, we love to praise. We're coming back in the building eventually, soon, sooner than you may think. But most of all, we love to serve. And so I'm encouraging all young adults, reach out to Pastor Trey, that's T. Walren, at fcbcnyc.org so you can volunteer at the Jackie Robinson Community Garden on Saturday, June 19th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Excellent. Now that we've done that, well, no matter where you are this morning, I want you to stand to your feet. We're going to put some words in the atmosphere and the universe. We're going to declare some things today with our identity statement. All right, beloved? Come on, let's say it together. No, let's declare it together. We are an ever-evolving community of visionaries, dreamers, and doers who have been called by God to live the lives we are created to live, commanded by God to love beyond the limits of our prejudices, and commissioned by God to serve. Called to live, commanded to love, and commissioned to serve. And for that, we are eternally grateful, grateful to live, love, and serve. Beloved, this morning, I, I want to do something a little different. I, I have multiple scriptures to use this morning, all from the same story, but I just want to read these scriptures to frame the story. It is found in the book of Hosea. That's in the Old Testament, the book of Hosea. And I want to read from a uh, few verses from chapter 1, chapter 3, and chapter 14. Hosea, chapter 1, and I want to read verses 2 through 3 from chapter 1. Hosea 1, 2, and 3, and here's how it reads. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take for yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom. For the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, daughter of Diblam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then I want to draw your attention to Hosea 3, verses 1 through 3. The Lord said to me again, go love a woman who has a lover and is an adulteress. Just as the Lord loves the people of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. 
So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer of barley and a measure of wine. And I said to her, you must remain as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore. You shall not have intercourse with a man, nor I with you. And then in the 14th chapter of the book of Hosea, I want to read verses 4 through 7. These are the words of God. I will heal their disloyalty. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall strike root like the forest of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive tree and his fragrance like that of Lebanon. They shall again live beneath my shadow. They shall flourish as a garden. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fragrance shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Let us, let us pray. God, we thank you and we honor you on this day and we are grateful, O oh God for how you continue to remind us of the sufficiency of your grace, your love. We're grateful, O oh Lord, that you are still mindful of us, even though at times, O oh God, we know that we can be difficult to deal with, and yet you are still mindful of us, loving on us, keeping us, sustaining us, guiding us, leading us. God, we thank you. Now, O oh God, in this time that is ours to share, continue to speak true to your words of promise to us that you, O oh God, would never leave nor forsake. Thank you, God. We honor you, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I do want to read those scriptures again, beloved, just, just quickly, and I won't be long this morning. But Hosea 1, verse 2 and 3, when the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take for yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. So he went and took home a daughter of Dibliam, and she conceived and bore him a son. Hosea 3, 1 through 3, the Lord said to me again, go love a woman who has a lover and is an adulteress, just as the Lord loves the people of Israel though they turn to other gods and love raisin cakes. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a home of barley and a measure of wine. And I said to her, you must remain as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore. You shall not have intercourse with a man, nor I with you. And 14 verses 4 through 7. I will heal their disloyalty. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall strike root like the forest of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive tree and his fragrance like that of Lebanon. They shall again live beneath my shadow. They shall flourish as a garden. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fragrance shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Amen. This morning, beloved, I want to speak from this thought. When loving hurts, when loving hurts. Hosea is a prophet that is not often talked about. It is a, he is a prophet that Often, many people do not discuss. We know of Elijah and Elisha, and we know of the other countless Old Testament prophets. But Hosea is considered a minor prophet. But although Hosea is a minor prophet, Hosea has a major assignment. In fact, I would argue that Hosea's assignment is not only the most unique of all the prophets in the Old Testament, but I think also one that is endearing in so many ways. You see, when you think of the prophets of old, 
those who are considered prophets from Moses on down, the great liberator, the prophets of Israel, the great prophets of Israel. Many of them were given an assignment connected to declaring what God wants to see done. Whether it was Moses letting Pharaoh know that God wanted the liberation of his people, whether it is the words from Elijah to the king Ahab about their disloyalty, no matter what it is, prophets were given assignments connected to the words they spoke and the acts connected to God's liberation for God's people. That is what we traditionally see in the Old Testament. But Hosea is radically different. Because God changes the way God operates with this prophet. God does not necessarily tell the prophet that your assignment is to declare what thus saith the Lord. God does not tell Hosea that I want you to say these words to my people, speak these words to my people so that they might avoid my wrath and be caught in my bosom of love and grace. That is not how Hosea's journey as a prophet begins. For Hosea is the only prophet that his introduction to the assignment by God is this. Hosea, I don't first want you to say what I want the people to hear. I want you to feel what I feel. This is radically different from what God has done in the Old Testament with other prophets and the prophets of old. Hosea, I want you to feel my pain. I want you to see and feel how at times my grace, my love can even cause discomfort. And I'm going to move through three phases of Hosea's story, and I pray that in this something will be gleaned that will speak to us all because I am convinced that Hosea's assignment still resonates with us today in very particular ways. In the very beginning, in chapter 1, God tells Hosea to do something that would be offensive to so many today. I want you to marry somebody, but Hosea, I want you to marry a prostitute. Or in the language of the Bible, a woman of whoredom and have children of whoredom. Can you imagine that God gives this assignment, that God grants him this assignment that is so direct and so clear that Hosea honors the call and honors its assignment. And, and, and imagine what Hosea must have felt. Can you imagine when God speaks to you about taking on a wife? And this is the person that God tells you to take on. Someone whom others have rejected, whom others have used, whom others have not loved. And God says, Hosea, I want you to make Gomer your wife. Just imagine what that must have felt like for Hosea. God has called him to this assignment, but then God has given him a directive that is connected to something that in his mind might have been defiling. Take this woman of whoredom, the scripture says, this prostitute, marry her and have children with her. This is what Hosea is told. Why? Why, God? Because, Hosea, maybe I want you to feel what I feel because Israel has played the whore with me. After all I've done, after all I've done for my people in Israel, they still turn their back. They still reject. They still don't honor, and they still go chasing after other gods in spite of the relationship, in spite of the history, in spite of what I've done. It is as if God is saying, Hosea, everything I've done has never been fully enough. I've poured out my love. I've poured out my grace. I've delivered. I've restored. I've set free. I've honored. I've elevated. And it still wasn't enough. They still play the language of God in this passage, the whore with me. And God said, Hosea, before you speak it, I want you to feel that. Can you imagine when, when, when God affords Hosea, and yes, affords Hosea, 
the opportunity to feel maybe a glimpse of what God feels. When your love is rejected by the loved, when, when, when all that you've done is never seemingly enough, and not that it's just not enough, but God tells Hosea, in essence, to love a woman who will never be committed to him. I hope you can capture that. And this is what Hosea wants, what's what God wants Hosea to feel, to love someone, to love people, to love a nation who may never be fully committed to him. When I was younger, I would hear people say things like, well, the Old Testament is the book of law, and the New Testament is the book of grace. That in the New Testament, through this new revelation of God through Jesus Christ, we see the grace and love of God. And I realized that in my own maturation, that was just an easy and simplistic way to give label and title to the Old Testament and the New Testament. But when you read the Old Testament, the Old Testament that is supposed to be the book of God's wrath and anger and God's judgment and punishment and God's law. Beloved, the truth is that the Old Testament is also a book of God's grace, of God leaning towards people who don't always lean towards God, of God loving on people who time and time again don't always fully love God back. It is going from Exodus on through this book in Hosea, those moments where God is continually being gracious and merciful and loving. And yes, there's some wrath in there, but don't let those wrathful moments overshadow the fact that God's love is present and grace is present. And here it is made manifest again. A few weeks ago, we talked about Jonah and how Jonah did not want to fulfill the assignment from God to go speak to the people of Nineveh because in Jonah's mind, he knew God would forgive them. Grace and love. And here, Hosea becomes a prophet who is now made to feel what God possibly feels, to love those who will not fully commit, to love those who will not fully love. That's how the story begins in that first chapter. Hosea honors what God says. He does what seems painful and dangerous. He marries Gomer. They have a son, Jezreel. And then there are two daughters named. And each of those children display what God will do. God is angry. God will reject. And then God is no longer their God. Those three names of those children reflect God's disposition. God is angry. God will reject. And God is no longer their God. Those are the children. Those are the offspring of the relationship with Hosea and Gomer. And those are the names given. God is angry. God will punish. God has rejected. And God is no longer their God. But then when you get to chapter 3, after Gomer has left Hosea, because she could not shake her ways and found herself with another man. God then tells Hosea again in chapter 3, go back. Go get her. Take whatever you have. Give it all to get her back. I need you to hear this today, beloved. First assignment is to marry the woman of whoredom. And bear these children of whoredom and the children, the offspring, are a reflection of the dysfunctional relationship between this man, Hosea, and this prostitute, Gomer. But not really. Those children also symbolize God's attitude towards God's people. God is angry. God will punish. God will reject. And God is not their God. And even with that, when Gomer leaves Homer and continues her ways and continues to give herself to others, and even in that moment, God tells Hosea, go and get her. Hosea has to go to the place of another man to go and get his wife, and he must now pay to get his wife back. Pay. Oh, you didn't get that. Sacrifice to get back the one who can't love him back. I hope you hear this today, beloved. 
Because remember, Hosea is the prophet who must not just declare the word, he must feel God's space and pain and disposition. That is a journey shaped by love, and God wanted Hosea to feel that. But just when we see Hosea's story, we cannot forget what is at the heart of this story. And it is a cause, in my mind, for all of us to be grateful. Sometime when you get a chance, read the entire book of Hosea. It is actually quite painful from Hosea's perspective. But you see, the reason why some of us may not fully appreciate or even appropriate this book that is often not talked about and often not preached from is because very often we don't want to see ourselves as Gomer. We want to see ourselves as Hosea. Why? We love being the hero of our own narratives. And sometimes the desire to be the hero in the narrative blinds us from being honest about who we are. And I know this morning, and this may even be uncomfortable to hear, but when we read this story, as much as you may want to resonate with Hosea, some part of you ought to feel a little bit like Gomer. And this is not to rag on Gomer or she was a horrible person, but my God, all of us in some way, shape, or form have Know what it is to be loved by a God who will not let us go. To be held by a God who will not let us go. Sometimes we forget the grace that was afforded us, the mercy that was afforded us, the love that was afforded us. Sometimes in our harshest moment, and usually that harsh moment is reserved for people we think are worthy of our harshness. In those moments, and we've all been there, we often forget the moments where mercy rescued us and grace redeemed us and love covered us. That we forget in those moments we want to be angry and want to be mad. We forget that there were moments when we did things that were deserving of wrath and anger and bitterness and punishment, and yet grace became sufficient. Mercy still endured and love still covered. There were moments where we thought we were being our best. We allow our insecurities to get the best of us and we did things, said things, acted in ways that were not reflective of who we claim to be as children of God. But grace became sufficient and mercy still endured and love still covered. There were moments along your journey where no matter how, how much you love God, in those moments, the love of God was not moving in you and through you and other thoughts came to your mind. And instead of showing that love, you are bitter and mean and, and sometimes even discourage other people, said things you didn't mean, acted in ways you didn't really mean, and yet you did that. And in those moments where you weren't at your best self in your best place and you were really at your worst moment, grace was still sufficient and mercy still endured and love still covered. Why? Because we all have blind spots and we all have unguarded moments and we're not always, always at our best. And there are moments when people encounter us, we are at our worst. And instead of being our best selves, we are our worst selves. And sometimes we forget that when we're at our worst and our worst selves, that grace is still sufficient. Mercy still endures and love still covers. That's why we're still here. And that's why we continue in spite of all that we do sometimes to let ourselves down and let people we love down. Grace is still sufficient and mercy still endures and love still covers. And when you know that, you have the obligation to make manifest the sufficiency of grace and the enduring nature of mercy and the covering nature of love to others. Because after all, that which you have been freely given, you freely give. Oh, this story of Hosea and Gomer is not so foreign. This was a story of God and Israel acted out through Hosea and Gomer. But don't forget if it's the story of God and Israel, it is also the story of God and us. Us. Those moments where we made gods out of things that did not deserve it. 
those moments where we gave our best worship and our best energy to things and spaces that could not love us back. Those times where we, we created God with the little g because somehow we needed those little g gods to feel good about ourselves. Yeah, we've all committed idolatry because that was Israel's problem. We all have given ourselves along our journey. We don't want to admit it to those little gods with the little g. Whether they were things, people, or places. And yet in those moments of indiscretion when we lost ourselves in things that we could never be found in in the first place. Grace was still sufficient. Mercy still endured. And love still covered. You see, I know there are people who preach these messages that are filled with judgment and wrath and punishment and pain. I know, and there are people who are critical of me, and, and I get them emails and the letters all the time. Why don't you talk about God's wrath? Why don't you talk about God's punishment? Why don't you talk about the wages of sin or death? If I could respond to all of them, which I do not, I would say because I read the entire Bible, not just the part I want to pick to punish. And when I read this book filled with moments of grace and mercy and love, how do I know? Oh, it's here. In that last chapter of Hosea that I read, after God chastised, after God challenged through the prophet, the book ends like this. I will heal their disloyalty. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned from them. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall blossom like the lily. He shall strike root like the forest of Lebanon. His shoots shall spread out. His beauty shall be like the olive tree and his fragrance like that of Lebanon. They shall again live beneath my shadow. They shall flourish as a garden. They shall blossom like the vine. Their fragrance shall be like the wine of Lebanon. That is how the story in Hosea ends. The God who restores, who reimagines, who loves, who pulls in even when we try to get away, who prospers us even when we try to pain God. Yeah. Sometimes love can hurt. But love also heals. That is what gives me hope. That is what enlivens me. That with all we could do to fall short or disappoint or anger God. Grace is still sufficient. Mercy still endures. And love still covers. And the words that God speaks to the people who have dishonored God, rejected God, worshiped other gods, fallen away, forgotten the relationship, forgotten the history, hear those words, I will love them freely. I'll restore them. They will find a place under my shadow. I will prosper them. What does that mean? And I know I get it all the time. Does that mean, Pastor, we can do whatever we want and God will forgive? We can act any old way and God will love us? We, can, we cannot honor anything of God and God will still bring us back? Well, yes and no. The yes is yes. God is that God. Of forgiveness. We all know that. But here's the part we forget. When 
you are in that relationship shaped by an un no an indefinable love that comes from God you won't seek to do whatever you won't seek to be any way you won't seek to just do anything because love not only restores but love leads and when you lead by love when you become shaped by love that means you always keep in your mind that grace is still sufficient mercy still endures and love still uncovers this story as painful as it can be is a story of hope and healing of a God who refuses to let you and I go. David understood that. And I close with these words. Words that can only be spoken by someone who has fallen and been picked up, fallen and been picked up, fallen and been picked up. Notice I didn't say fallen and got up. I said fallen and been picked up. When you've, been, when you've fallen and been picked up numerous times over your life, in those moments where you didn't even want to be picked up because you didn't even know how to love yourself and restore yourself and care about yourself and you fell and were picked up and you fell again and you got picked up. When you've had those experiences numerous times over your life with God, you know the kind of words you begin to say? Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Forever. Beloved, grace is still sufficient. Mercy still endures and love still covers. Come on, let's pray. There's so much, oh God, we can say right now. But we want to say thank you. Thank you, God. For never giving up on us. Even in those moments where we gave up on ourselves. Thank you. For always loving on us those moments where we forgot to love ourselves. Thank you for holding us in those moments when we didn't want to be held. God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, oh God, this morning for the reminder. The reminder that says, if that is how we've experienced you, then others must experience you that way through us. Through us. Which means that we must be gracious, we must be merciful, and we must be loving. Thank you for the responsibility, God, of being human. Human. We love you, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Remember, until next time, be gracious, be merciful, and be loving. Peace and blessings.